So we are now left with just three more topics in our webinars. And today, this is just to introduce the Ayurvedic view on surgery. And I hope you're able to hear clearly. Uh, surgery was actually a branch in Ayurveda. Why we are discussing this topic is to give a perspective on surgery from the Ayurvedic viewpoint. Uh, you know, surgery was also considered as an option for Ayurvedic treatment. Uh, the problem is that today, sometimes we think that whenever surgery is an option, Ayurveda can be an alternative. This is not true. There are some diseases which are truly surgical. And when they are really surgical, we may have to opt for surgery. On the other hand, surgery is often prescribed when it is not needed. And so in such conditions, definitely Ayurveda can offer alternative treatments like, for example, you know, certain replacement of the joints. In my own experience, I have been able to prevent a lot of joint replacement surgeries uh, with Ayurvedic interventions. Uh, but at the same time, when the damage is beyond a certain limit, then we will have to go for surgery. So what is that critical point which this, in which we can decide whether a patient needs surgery or not? That's the topic of our discussion. So I'm not going to go into all the details of how surgeries are performed because this is really very specialized and uh, the work of a well-trained surgeon. And uh, rather we will be talking about the diseases and conditions in which surgery may be required and also those diseases and conditions where definitely we can avoid surgery. So that's the perspective with which we look at it. And also it's important when we study Ayurveda to know that surgery was considered as a part of Ayurveda treatment. It was quite well developed also in ancient India. It's quite impressive. So we will quickly run through some of the topics. Uh, the first one is, of course, the blunt surgical instruments. In Ayurveda, surgical instruments were broadly classified into two, the blunt surgical instruments and then the sharp surgical instruments. And these instruments were used, uh, you know, for various kinds of procedures in the body, even for diagnostic purposes. And there are hundreds of such instruments described in the Ayurvedic texts. And it's very interesting to note that many of these uh, surgical instruments are even today used uh, quite in the same way they were used in ancient days. Let's have a quick look at some of the pictures. As you can see here, these are the blunt instruments. These were called as the yantras. All blunt surgical instruments are called yantras in Ayurveda. So here we have the tubular So the tubular instruments here, uh, they are called as a Nadi Yantra, they are in tube shape. And here, this is kind of a speculum, which is used to see the body pass. And you can see in this way, there are many instruments described in the ancient Ayurvedic texts. So you can see here the various times, kinds of forceps and other instruments. Some of them are sharp. So see here, 
uh, many of these instruments were very cleverly designed looking at the shape of animals. So the idea was that the mouth of the animals have a very special, uh, you know, shape. And with that, because of that shape, they are able to perform certain functions by getting their prey or tearing into the flesh. So in ancient Ayurvedic surgery, uh, these surgical equipments were shaped like the mouth, the beaks of the birds or certain other animals which use to tear flesh. And so that shape actually helped them to use these instruments for the surgical procedures. Yeah, I did not quite get your remark. Can you please explain what what do you mean by it makes you want to take care? What did you mean by that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yes, I mean, uh, the interesting thing in Ayurveda is that Ayurveda is quite broad. It accepts, you know, anything that is useful to protect and preserve the body. And so even surgery, they went and developed it to such an extent that, you know, uh, they developed quite a sophisticated system to do surgery. So here is another surgical instrument developed by Sushruta. So what are yantras? So we will very quickly and briefly get an idea because uh, I think it's very important for Ayurvedic physicians to know the context for surgery and also to appreciate, you know, what are the surgical procedures that are offered today by modern medicine and which context we should refer our patients and which context we should not. So the instruments which are useful to extract the different types of foreign bodies causing pain in different parts of the body. So, you know, to examine hemorrhoids, rectal fistula, to apply certain medications, and uh, to certain procedures, when you do certain procedures, surgical procedures, you need to protect the body. And so, for all these purposes, the auxiliary instruments that we use, these are called yantras. So it might be very interesting for us to note that in Ayurveda we used, Ayurveda was one of the earliest systems to use what we call as scopy, you know, endoscopy, proctoscopy, and all these sophisticated procedures were actually uh, done with the help of instruments in classical uh, Ayurveda. So, this is a definition of yantras. So this is the general description that a yantra or a device can translate yantra as a device. Uh, which resembles the mouth of a bird or like heron or an animal like lion or bear or crow. And so they are, they, as I said, they resemble these animals. Now there are also other types of instruments which are called as cruciform instruments. And these are having a specific 
length, 18 angulas in length. They're made chiefly from iron. You know, they're shaped like a masura dala, that is the shape of a lentil. So you can see these equipments were all developed on the basis of things that we see around us from animals, from vegetables. And uh, so these are used to pull out foreign bodies stuck in bones from the body. So you can see like uh, Ayurveda wanted to become a complete medical system. So this is the spirit of Ayurveda that you know you are not against any, any intervention that is helpful to protect and preserve the body. And so they went to a great extent of sophistication to develop these uh, devices. So they had, again, certain other types of uh, devices are the forceps. These were called as the samdam shayantras. Uh, there were two types with a catch at its tip and without a catch. And one with the catch was 16 angulas length, and it was used for extracting foreign bodies stuck in the skin, veins, tendons, and muscles. Now, this gives us an idea of how surgeons explored the different parts of the body. They were able to separate the skin, veins, tendons, and also uh, probe into them with these uh, forceps. And the length of the forceps were also kind of decided depending on the tissues that you were actually dealing with. And then there are also the forceps with teeth, and they were called as muchundi yandra. And this is actually to hold and pull fleshy parts from deep wounds and also to remove certain tumors and, uh, you know, certain growths. So those teeth help us to get the grip and actually pull out these uh, you know, foreign bodies. Then there are the flat arm instruments. So, you know, I'm just going to quickly run through these slides. And, and uh, you don't need to really, you know, learn these in great detail. But it's good to keep this in mind because today a lot of cases will come to us with an indication for surgery. And so when we know that Ayurveda also had surgery and in many conditions it recommended surgery. So when with this background knowledge, it becomes more easier for us to decide whether we should uh, recommend surgery to a, a patient or not. Like in India, this is a situation that has come that many patients today come to our clinic and they come to me and they say allopathic doctors have recommended surgery but they decide only if we say that really they should have surgery. So, you know, this is a big uh, confidence that we've been able to create, that they, they know the Ayurvedic physician says that there is surgery is needed, then it means there's really no other way. So they trust nowadays, a lot of patients trust Ayurvedic physicians in India when they want to take a call on whether they need surgery or not. So that's what we will learn through our discussions today. So, you know, here is a special instrument to remove equipments from the, I mean, remove foreign bodies and unwanted substances from the ear. And then we have the tubular yantras, which we showed. This is for looking inside body parts. For recognizing foreign bodies and diseases, localizing channels of the tissues, for facilitating treatments and you know sucking them out, and so these are to the the precursors of what we call today as endoscopes, endoscopic exploration. So why I wanted to tell this is you know. Uh, when it is really necessary, you may have to do these copies. There is nothing like uh, a proper diagnosis. So today, of course, we know that endoscopies and these investigations are done sometimes, even if they're not really necessary, they're a bit invasive. But, you know, if you look at it from an Ayurvedic perspective, uh, you know, Ayurveda is not an alternative also 
whenever a patient is frightened or doesn't want to do a particular test, you know, you cannot come to Ayurveda and say, please give a alternative. So that's what we must understand here. Ayurveda has also prescribed these kind of instruments to study deeper. If you want to visualize the stomach in certain conditions, you may have to use a tubular instrument and really look at what's inside. And then only we can decide a treatment. So these things are really, uh, you know, an indication of where Ayurveda recommends such type of uh, investigations. So you can see here there is a special instrument for looking into the throat. And they come with different openings. And you can develop these kind of uh, endoscopes for looking into the throat, for looking into the rectum, looking into other body orifices, for looking into the nose and the ear and the, the stomach. So in this way, you see a lot of these scope, endoscopic instruments have been developed and described in the Ayurvedic texts. So some of these uh, tubular instruments also came with certain devices. So by so this is this is very similar to the modern you know robotic surgeon, where you are visualizing the internal organ and then guiding uh, a, another instrument inside, uh, and then removing the foreign body after visualizing it. So see, uh, many of these procedures which were used today were already, wish, uh, you know, thought about in Ayurveda and they give uh, examples and give models on how these things can be done. Now here is a proctoscope, which is called as the Arshoyantra and using this instrument we view the hemorrhoid inside the rectum. It has a cylindrical say, shape. And its circumference is five angulas in men and six angulas for women with two orifices at each end, useful for seeing the pile masses. And with one slit, you know, you can bring the pile mass into the proctoscope and then visualize it. So there were different types of proctoscopes that were used in Ayurveda. So here are other scopes to look into and study tumors to understand the shape and size of tumors and also polyps, visualizing polyps inside the passages and uh, things like that. So there is you know, also what is called as a finger protector. So when you are working on patients, you use this cap on the finger to protect it from sharp instruments and also to extend the finger into areas where you cannot reach. So you also had devices like this. Now there are also special instruments to work on the genital organs and wounds and they have four flaps. So if you want to dilate the opening and visualize the cervix and the uterus. So this is again a very special and specialized device. And then, you know, you have for oiling the sinus two instruments, one for oiling the sinus. Uh, so that is, uh, is an enema nozzle with an orifice and then, you know, you have for ascites, you know, where there is fluid accumulated in the abdominal cavity and with this you can actually 
you do the tapping, you know, removal of the surgical removal of excess body fluid accumulated. And then we also use many other simple, uh, you know, uh, devices that are derived from animal uh, and vegetables. So the animal horn is used for sucking. Uh, like if you want to suck blood from a particular region, we use the animal horn. This is very similar to the cupping treatment uh, done in Chinese medicine. Are you aware of this procedure? Yes, so in Ayurveda also, the cupping treatment is done, and this is done with the help of these vegetable substances and animal. So even pots are used, and the holo god from animals is called the bot god. This is used, or animal horns are used. So these are used for the cupping treatment. And then there are the probes. The probes are used to explore the body orif or orifices. And uh, they are shaped. Most of the instruments in Ayurveda are shaped on the basis of, you know, the animals. And uh, we develop this intelligence by watching and observing how animals uh, you know, uh, do their activities and using that, the instruments are developed and to serve that specific function. So there are also hooks. These are called the Shanku Yantras. And these are used to, you know, when there are objects which are very hard and fixed, we have to use a hook to hold them uh, strongly and then pull them out. And such a hook was used also to remove a dead fetus from the uterus or to remove uh, a stone from the urinary bladder. And they were also used to extract teeth, you know, from the mouth. So these are all extremely sophisticated and very specialized instruments. Like, in fact, if I were to show diagrams of each of these equipments and explain their function, you might even think that it is a lecture on, you know, modern surgery. So, so much of detail is seen in Ayurveda. And so you can imagine that Ayurveda uh, accepts and clearly defines what is the soap of surgery. So now there were also different yantras which were used for cleaning the sinuses. So you know, you know today in sinusitis, A lot of people come to us uh, when they want to avoid surgery. And in fact, we are able to avoid surgery in quite a large number of situations. We are able to avoid surgery for sinusitis. So sometimes the tapping is done, the extra fluid is removed. But in Ayurveda, we also also have an equipment for this. So in some rare conditions, Ayurveda also recommended such a treatment. But 
And here, usually patients come to me for sinusitis when they don't want to do these surgical procedures because even after the procedure, there is recurrence. And 90% of the times, we are able to treat this condition without really doing surgery. So we have uh, such yantras for probes for draining from different organs. Now we have certain other yantras for cautery. When we do thermocautery, there is a small mistake here. Uh, it's called as an Hernia. There's no international hernia. I'm very sorry about that type of error. It's internal hernia in the scrotum, inguinal, sorry, inguinal hernia in the scrotum. And, uh, so we have all the yantras to apply caustic senses to burn away tissue. And, and uh, these, these were also very specialized yantras. And then there are many supporting devices like magnets were used, ropes were used, clothes, certain type of stones, hammer, leather strap. So when they do orthopedic surgeries, you know, you have these hammers. Even today you can see orthopedic surgeons do a lot of, you know, almost uh, carpentry work, branches of trees. So there are wooden appliances, nails, mouth, teeth. And all these things, other things, or even emotions are considered as devices. You know, the patient should not have fear. Things which can bring comfort and uh, release the tension of the patient, all these things are used as devices to support surgical operations. So these are the functions of these devices to pull out things after crushing to pull out after to fill certain cavities with some fluid medicines to kind of open the passages like you know when you do what is a stent you are opening the you know blood vessels and improving the blood circulation many things together, extracting, then binding, rubbing, sucking, and removing, lifting up certain organs or body parts, pushing down, bending down, shaking, sometimes to break and repair, uh, straightening the organs. These are all the functions of blunt instruments. Today we know that even today blunt instruments are actually used for this purposes. So they found that Kankamukha is one of the entras, the device which is very flexible and which can be used in 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 a lot of conditions, this was considered one of the best to use. And do you know which Ayurveda is considered as the best surgical device? According to Ayurveda, the best surgical device is one's hand itself. So with uh, the all these equipments become functional and fruitful only when they are handled by a person with ill hands. So that was the uh, overview of the devices that are used. And this is the blunt surgical instruments. So do you have any questions about this or just want to know what you felt about this, this understanding from Ayurveda? Were you aware of the depth of the depth, uh, branch of surgery in Ayurveda before? Did you did you had any idea that Ayurveda describes so many accessory 
surgical devices. What does this mean for you? Did you think Ayurveda was uh, against surgery? That is totally different. It is not spiritual surgery. It is actually, you know, it is like a device to handle the spiritual energy currents. It is to stabilize Sri Yantra, stabilizes. The spiritual energies and currents in the human body. Yes. So there are many such yantras. Yantra generally does means only a device. So these are actually surgical devices. Sri Yantra is not a surgical device. So a surgical yantra is called as a Shaya Yantra which means it's for surgery. So what we shall really be discussing today is the Ayurvedic concept with which we are able to decide whether a particular treatment, uh, you know, whether uh, Surgery is actually required in a particular disease. On what basis will we decide that? That is what we will be actually uh, discussing after our preliminary review of surgical events and surgical procedures. So is this clear? Can we move on to the next topic? Any questions or any? Yes. So now we come to the sharp surgical instruments. So in Ayurveda, sharp surgical instruments were made with such precision that you know you could even split a hair into two that was the criteria of the sharpness that the instruments had to be so sharp that you, that you could you know split the hair into two so such instruments of such sharpness were actually used in the ayurvedic uh, tradition of surgery and when we use such instruments, you are able to create surgical wounds that are very fine and very thin and very efficient. So here are some of the sharp surgical instruments. It includes special needles for suturing.
and um, you know specific uh, instruments for puncturing and for you know incision excision all the surgical procedures are described in ayurvedic texts and we will come back to that shortly so here you can see different types of scissors and different types of uh, you know, sharp instruments, scalpels. Here is a set of instruments used and developed uh, in the Ayurvedic textbooks. So here are more. These are some, just some pictures to visualize how these equipments may have looked like in those days. So the sharp, there were about 26 major sharp surgical instruments that were, you know, described in the ancient Ayurvedic textbooks. There were much, much more, but these are some of the uh, main surgical instruments we'll very quickly review them so these are prepared from skilled metal smiths as as the traditional method of preparing surgical instruments and they are usually much smaller than the yantras or devices that we talked about they are long capable of uh, splitting So they are used mainly from strong steel like iron and the edges are actually very hello. Uh, these instruments are made ex especially extremely sharp and uh, the cutting edges are one fourth or half or one eighth of their own size and each instrument two or three in number should be suitable to the site and place of operation. Here are some of the names of these uh, equipments and we need not worry about it because this is just to introduce the scope of surgery. We will come a little later to the more clinical aspects of to decide where a case is surgical or not. And I will give examples of many diseases where we have to take this very crucial decision. So some of the names I will explain. Mandalagra <clears throat> means circular. The edge is circular. Vridhipatra means it is like you know, the shape of a, a, a rice grain, like the shape of a lotus leaf. So depending on the lotus petal, so depending on the shape of the uh, instrument, it has been given very specific names. So we will just quickly look at the description of some of these uh, surgical instruments. The Mandalagra Shastra has round edge at its uh, tip and it is in the shape of the nail of the index finger and this is used for scraping, cutting and you know, like if you have a cyst in the eyelid for tonsils, these are used, these, uh, the Mandalagra is used to cut and excise. Uh, the Vridhipra is like a razor. It's used for cutting, for excising, for splitting, 
to create incision, tearing, separating, and uh, then the Patra and Ardhadar are lancets, and these are also used for splitting and cutting. Now there is a special uh, surgical sharp instrument which is like a This is used for the excision of polyps. There is a sharp probe which is used for exploring sinuses, is smooth and shaped in the mouth of an earthworm. So there's here's another probe. Uh, so there are blunt probes and also sharp probes. And here is a sharp probe which is used for splitting. There is an instrument for puncturing. There is a, a scissor, which is like a heron's uh, beak. And there is a, another instrument for cleaning out liquids from cavities of the body. This is like a three spiked brush. And then we have the Kusha Patra, which is a razor resembling the blade of the Kusha grass. And then we have a razor is in the beak of a hawk, again, which is meant for draining. I would like to ask, are you able to follow what I'm saying? Okay. Is it okay if we... Because, you know, it's, it's only for information, not for practice. Okay, because this is just to give you an exposure, because when you are studying Ayurveda and practicing Ayurveda, it's, it's also important to know the extent to which Ayurveda developed used surgery. But the only purpose, it's not for practice. So I don't think we have to waste too much time going into details of this, but just an overview. So I'm just running through these slides. So here is another instrument for draining. Uh, and this is for puncturing veins and the abdomen is Vrihimukha. That's again another special, you know, instrument. Then we have an axe, which is called as a kutari. And uh, it's having a wooden handle. And from this, the veins situated on bones should be cut, keeping the handle of this axe vertically over it. So this is to do vinisection. Then we have a rod made of copper, and this is to be used in the eye for cataract couching. So you can see very specialized instrument to use in the eye. And then there is a finger knife, which you can put on your finger and then, you know, go inside and cut the organs. So in places where you can insert your finger and then do a excision or incision so this is usually done in the throat so the finger of the physician is inserted uh, into the throat and uh, where on the finger you already place this knife and that is how this is done so then we have a sharp hook with a bent blade and this is meant for holding enlarged, you know, uvula or for the pterygium. This enables you to hold a particular enlarged tissue and then move it. And then we have karapatra, which is a saw. You know, this is like carpentry. You have an instrument with which you can actually cut the bone into two. So this is done in very advanced, this is used in very advanced reconstructive bone surgery and you can see imagine 3000 years ago this was also developed and described in ayurveda and then we have the scissors which are used for cutting tendons threads hairs 
and this is also used uh, you know in our common life but surgical scissors or something different so the, we also have certain equipments to remove minute foreign bodies extremely small particles so these equipments are able to you know probe and get those minute particles and remove it and then we have a special dental lancet which one edge four angular shape like a knot on one side and it is meant for scrapping the you know the deposits on the teeth and for removing it and then we have the needles for suturing which is of three kinds round strong and stout having passing in through a hole in their body near its root so these needles are used for you know stitching so we have curved needle then we have brush with spark sharp spikes it is used for removing you know dark patches loss of hair and those things it is used for scraping then there is another equipment which is a churner so this is used to churn you know locations where blood is clotted so by churn using this churner the clotted blood is collected and removed then we have an instrument for puncturing the ear lobe then we have a cutting pit so this is used for puncturing swellings to see whether it has ripened or not and then we have the accessory you know surgical instruments which are the leeches caustic alkalis fire glass cow dung cake nail stone and many other instruments which are used to surgical so here is again an overview of surgical instruments which are sharp so we quickly looked at both blunt sharp surgical instruments and the various functions of surgical instruments are described it's extracting it's tearing splitting it's suturing probing scraping scratching incising puncturing minutely beating hitting pounding excising breaking puncturing churning holding and grasping also burning and cauterizing so it's a wide range of functions that the surgical instruments are dealing with and these instruments are also you know to be carefully made so that they don't have the defects they shouldn't be blunt they shouldn't break they shouldn't be too thin they shouldn't be too thick they should they should have the proper length they have the correct curvedness or irregular shape and then they should also have the rough edge and these are the defects Uh, if they have rough edge then it is these are all the defects of the sharp instruments so again you have a lot of detailed descriptions on how to these surgical instruments how to handle them how to hold them so there are special wooden handles that are developed to hold, use these surgical instruments so and how handling of each surgical instrument has been described in great detail so the purpose here is that you are not hurting the physician doesn't hurt himself with these sharp instruments or the physician does not actually you know uh, harm the patient by you know holding it in a wrong position certain uh, equipment should be held at its mouth some equipments have to be held at their root and others you can use in your convenient manner so these are the details to which the surgical instruments uh, were actually elaborated and protocols were developed on how to handle them
and you have also a special pouch to keep the surgical instruments so in those days the surgical instruments were also stored and kept in a special storage pouch and these were made of various materials and it had threads and you know had compartments and in equipments had to be wrapped in wool so they were all kept with good care and they had to be held and kept very securely so now we come to in greater detail about leeches so this will be of interest to us because leech therapy is a uh, have you witnessed which leech therapy Have you heard about it? Yes, today leech is uh, accepted as a medical device. So we cannot use all types of leeches. There are certain types of leeches which are, you know, medicinally useful and there is elaborate procedure on how to use leeches the leeches are kept for a short time in water and they are this water has the paste of turmeric in grain washed water and then they are put back into pure water so after this treatment because this uh, when you apply turmeric the leech will vomit any blood that is there inside. So this is a method of purifying the leech before we, you know, apply it for medicinal purposes. Yes, it is good in conditions. But it is actually good when, you know, blood is... Uh, localized and you know in a clotted condition if the blood is stagnating for example stagnated localized blood This is where leech is used because leech, as you know, has an anticoagulant. So when you apply leech, then the clotted bed becomes thin and it starts flowing. So leech is not helpful if you know. So when blood is, uh, when there is pitta involvement, because pitta is hot, the blood is not clotted. So leech is helpful when kapha or vata kapha is involved. Is that clear? Yes. So when pitta is more, the blood is hot and flowing more. In fact, when pitta is increased, there can also be bleeding. So, so how can you use uh, the leech? If you use leech when there is bleeding, then the bleeding will actually increase. So, Bleeding is a contraindication for using leech. If people are suffering from eating disorders or if they are uh, pitta is increased then too much then we will not use
the leech. So this is important. Is this clear? Okay, so the leeches are actually made to be attracted to the particular part of the body. You can rub that part with ghee, mud or breast milk or blood. Nowadays what we do is, uh, you know, just prick the part of the patient's body where we want the leech to suck. So we make a small prick and then there is a blood drop. And we keep the leech on the blood and the leech will start sucking that blood. So when it starts sucking the blood, we, we will usually what we do is we put a thin wet cloth on top of the leech and, and then allow the leech to actually suck the blood. The leech will According to Ayurveda, the leech has the ability to identify, you know, bad blood and good blood. And the Ayurvedic idea is that the leech will be able to suck only the bad blood. Just like the swan sucks the milk from a mixture of milk and water. So in this way, the bad blood is supposedly removed by the leech. So leech therapy is indicated in gulma, tumors of the abdomen. These are the conditions in which we give, uh, you know, leech therapy. In hemorrhoids, in abscess, like in many conditions, we are able to prevent abscesses from, you know, bursting creating a very big pus because if we remove the blood with leech then the abscess completely shrinks so it will not burst open and produce a lot of pus so it is also done in skin diseases localized skin diseases it is done in uh, rheumatoid arthritis or gouty arthritis it is also administered in diseases of the neck and eyes it is given in poison and it is also a given in conditions like herpes. So these are all diseases in which leech therapy is indicated. Uh, we don't uh, do this because you know the malignant cells may be released into the bloodstream and the cancer will spread. So this is really very, very, you have to be very careful when we use leeches. Another problem is we have to be very careful if we are going to reuse the leech. If the, there is a indication that leech may be uh, you know, able to spread some diseases like HIV or, you know, hepatitis. So now some protocols are made on the safe use of leeches. So you have to always make sure you use a fresh leech and ensure that this leech has not been exposed to any other patient who has such communicable diseases. So there are some precautions and uh, limitations for the use of leech. Now when pricking pain or itching develops at the side of the bite, the leech should be removed and then they are made to vomit the sucked blood by touching their mouth with salt and oil or by gently rubbing in the direction of their mouth after smearing fine rice flour over them. So once the leech has sucked the blood, and what Ayurveda says is that when it has sucked all the bad blood, then it will automatically release itself.
So after vomiting, the leech regains its private activity and then becomes uh, strong. So in ancient days, these leeches used to be reused after seven days. But nowadays, reuse is not recommended. If the vomiting is improper, it becomes AC inactive and intoxicated. If it vomits too much of blood, it may become very weak or may even die. Now, leech bites. They should be Uh, you know, removed and transferred to a different pot. And there are specific protocols mentioned on how to preserve these leeches. Sometimes some leech bites can cause allergic reactions. So certain types, there is only one type of leech which Ayurveda recommends for use. This is called the medicinal leech. So some leeches can be slightly poisonous, some leech bites can cause itching and other irritation. So if you feel, if we think or suspect that the leech that we have applied could have any of these problems, then we must allow the site of that bite to bleed by applying the paste of uh, turmeric and jaggery and honey. And then a piece of cloth soaked in shatadhauda grita, which means, you know, ghee washed in water a hundred times. Now this is something which I can explain to you. Did I explain about this before? Are you aware of this simple preparation? Have you heard about ghee washed in water a hundred times? Because this is very good for cooling. You know, removing burning sensation. And it's very easy to make. You just need to clean, literally wash ghee in water for a hundred times. Repeat the washing of ghee in water. When it is repeated a hundred times, the ghee becomes extremely cool in potency. And this can be used to relieve burning sensation. Have you heard about this? Well, it's very easy to make. So this ghee washed in a water a hundred times, this paste is actually used and applied on the site of the bite. And this helps to relieve the burn sensation and the irritation. Uh, and any such uh, skin irritations which is extremely you know burning or hot can be very relieved with this preparation so once the blood is allowed to flow and the heat is reduced then usually the allergy or irritation of leech bite subsides now we also use a bit of uh, the Bot gourd or a pot. This is used as a cupping method. So I hope you are already aware of cupping. Does anyone practice cupping? Okay. So Ayurveda also recommends this.
So this is again done to move blood that is localized in a particular region. So a bottle gourd or a pot. So again here, you know, uh, we should not do this method when pitta is aggravated because here heat is used. So this should be done only when vata and kapha is involved. Is it? So, similarly, in either we always horn to remove blood. Whereas horn should not be used in kapha. Because the blood is extremely thick when the, this is used only when the blood is extremely thick. So the horn should be used only when Vata and Pitta are, you know, deranged. So, again, ghata or a pot. Is to be used for vata and kapha, but not for pitta. So these are some of the things that we have to consider when we do bloodletting. And in many diseases in Ayurveda, bloodletting is indicated. So I hope you a note of those diseases in which Ayurveda recommends bloodletting. So there is another method of bloodletting in which, you know, uh, we actually make incisions, superficial wounds on the skin and allow the blood flow. This we must avoid many spots on the body, tendons, joints, bones, and vital spots. And it should not be horizontal way. It's always done in the vertical direction. So when you have, this is usually done in certain eczemas. Uh, I hope you're aware of eczema. It's an eczema, it's a type of skin disease. So this method, which is called as prachana, or, you know, removing blood by creating incisions. This is done in such diseases like eczema. Although, so this is uh, because eczema you will see in the feet, it's very localized in a particular area. And this is an area where there's a lot of venous blood that stagnates. So, pricking that area, with being several superficial incisions on the skin, a lot of blood is removed from the surrounding area. And so, fresh blood flows to that, that area. And this is done, is very effective in conditions like eczema. Whereas, blood accumulated in tumors or abscesses, they are usually removed by leeches. So when blood, the problem in the blood causes loss of sensation, then horn is used or gods are used or pot is used. And if the blood is 
vitiate all over the body. If the if the problem with the blood is systemic and not local, then venesection is done. So you know, blood uh, bloodletting was practiced also by many other medical systems, including even modern medicine earlier, but it fell into disuse. But the peculiarity or the importance of bloodletting in Ayurveda is that the indications of what type of bloodletting, where we should do bloodletting, what type of should be done, and what, what those, what disease, what condition, which type of bloodletting is effective. This is a kind of specialized knowledge that we see in Ayurveda. And bloodletting is rarely the first line of treatment. It is not used as the first line. It is always done when treatments fail. But not just when other treatments fail, only when there is a clearly indication that blood is deranged or vitiated. Only in that condition we are supposed to do bloodletting. So, and also it's important to know all conditions in which blood is deranged does not need bloodletting. So, so this is uh, these uh, these decisions of the specific indications of where and how to use bloodletting has been very clearly described in the Vedic text. If we know these guidelines, then we are able to, uh, you know, make very good outcomes because if. If the bloodletting is done in the wrong way, like if we choose leech for a pitta condition or if we use cupping with uh, the gourd or bottle gourd when a pitta condition, then it can lead to complications. So I think what makes Ayurvedic contribution to bloodletting really interesting and important are the elaborate guidelines, the minute details that have been given to ensure that bloodletting is effective and it is only done in the conditions where it is really so this is again the final summary. Removal of blood by incisions is done when the blood is solidified, by leeches when it is deep seated, by gourd, port or horn when it is localized in the skin and by venesection when it is providing the entire body. By using horn leeches gourd for the seeds of vatas and other doshas respectively. So after the bleeding procedure, the site of blood is covered with a cooling paste. And usually ghee and liquor ice is made into a mixture and applied for quick healing, pain, remo uh, preventing pain. So it reduces the pain, itching and edema at the site. And the area should be bathed with warm ghee. So this is the description about bloodletting in Ayurveda and so we discuss this under sharp surgical instruments because bloodletting is done with sharp sur surgical instruments. So with this we com uh, complete one section of today's discussion, the blunt and sharp surgical instruments and especially the context and uh, applications of bloodletting and there are certain diseases, like for example, in my experience, rheumatoid arthritis. When the when the in rheumatoid arthritis and in skin diseases, I have found bloodletting extremely helpful. So in rheumatoid arthritis, when in the joints, when there is excessive swelling, there is excessive warmth, especially in knee joint, ankle joint, I have applied leech very successfully.
even if you give internal and external medications, strong medicines, it is unable to bring down the swelling and the discomfort. But if we do two or three sittings of leech therapy, and then we administer our medicines, the results are dramatic. And in skin diseases like eczema, and also in skin diseases, which are very chronic, like certain types of psoriasis, we are able to administer the bloodletting and get very good results. So we will continue, but let's have a short break. I'm trying to do a long session today and so that we complete this uh, topic because our next topics are a four hours duration each and it will not be good if we break each uh, topic after three hours because the next day we have to do just a single hour so it'd be good if we can finish it uh, you know in one sitting so we continue with our session now <clears throat> and uh, now we look at the surgical procedures as described in Ayurvedic texts. <clears throat> so far we looked at the uh, surgical instruments, both the blunt and sharp instruments, as well as the elaborate procedures for bloodletting. And now we are going to look at why weather describes the various surgical procedures. So actually in Ayurveda, the whole goal is to try and prevent surgery. So surgery is considered as a, a last option when other methods fail. So usually surgery was done to remove pus from separating wounds and ulcers. That was the most common reason why surgery was done. Surgery was also done in ancient days to, you know, stitch wounds, mend broken bones during war or due to trauma and accidents. When it comes to wounds and ulcers so what was actually attempted was to see if how best we can avoid surgery So one is the application of cold poultices, bathing the part with cold decoction of drugs, doing bloodletting and doing panchakarma therapies. So these are usually done as a measure to see if we can avoid surgery. So this is very interesting. So in Ayurveda, uh, the, when you come to the section on surgery, what is first mentioned? is a list of procedures and protocols with which we try to avoid surgery. And this is what makes perhaps Ayurvedic texts approach to surgery different from that in modern medicine. In modern medicine, we are trying to see how to do surgery. Where is the condition where surgery is needed? But in Ayurveda, always the emphasis is even when you think surgery is needed or condition looks like you may need to do surgery, uh, what best we can do to prevent it? So these are some of the measures, like if you can prevent the suppuration, whether with the medical management or minor surgery is bloodletting or by purifying the body, cleansing the system with the use of medicines. If we are able to resolve the condition, then we can avoid surgery. 
Now, this is why uh, treating with Ayurveda is always an option to minimize the need for surgery. So, shopa or swelling is in Ayurveda of three stages the ama or unripe stage, then the stage of ripening, and then the fully ripened uh, wound or ulcer. So, in the ama stage, we are not supposed to do surgery, nor in the ripening stage, we are supposed to do surgery only if it comes to the pakwa or ripened stage. So in the early stages when the swelling is unripe, according to this classification is very unique to Ayurveda. So when you see a, an ulcer or a boil or an abscess forming, <clears throat> uh, it is classified into these three stages. In the early stage, it is mild with slight heat and pain and the swelling has the same color as the skin and the swelling is immovable it is very hard in the beginning stage very tender to touch and when the swelling begins to ripen then you can see that the color of the swelling begins to change it is no longer the color of the skin it is red color it enlarges like an animal bladder. It produces continuous bursting type of pain and it produces aches all over the body. There is, you feel excess of yawning, different kinds of distressing symptoms. There is anorexia. So you will find <clears throat> this process of ripening of a swelling also producing systemic symptoms. There is burning sensation, there is increased temperature, there is thirst, there is fever, there is loss of sleep, and there is, if you put a little ghee on, on the top of that abscess, that ghee will, the solid ghee will melt because that temperature is so strong. And in this stage, when it is ripening, it is the most tender to touch. And it is in this stage that the swelling produces the maximum discomfort for the patient. So this is the second stage of a swelling. The unripe stage and then the ripening stage. And then we come to the ripe swelling. So once the swelling completely ripens, then the intensity of the pain is reduced. It becomes mild. Even the swelling shrinks a little bit. It takes on a whitish color. And then wrinkles develop on the swelling. It is depressed all around, but elevated at its center. Then it produces itching, there is mild swelling, it is very soft. And the movement of understood by touch just as movement of water in a bladder, you can feel the pus. So in this stage, the swelling is considered to be ripened. So these are the three stages of swelling. Is this clear? So even small boils and ulcers go through these three stages and this can be clinically identified. So, when there is a swelling, this is also a very important basic concept in Ayurveda. 
The pain in these swellings is caused by vata and the burning sensation due to pitta and the inflammation or the swelling is due to kapha and the redness is due to blood. So these are the four signs of a swelling. That is pain, burning, swelling and redness. So when there is more pain, then we understand that vata is dominating. When there is more burning, then it is pitta. When there is more swelling, then it is kapha. And when there is redness, then it means rakta. So these are four simple signs on the basis of which we are able to decide which dosha is dominating. And when this pus formation increases more and there is cavity formation inside the swelling, the skin becomes thin and destroyed by the doshas. It becomes covered by wrinkles, there is black color, body hair falls off. These are all further developments of the swelling. So. <clears throat> when kapha is dominant, the swelling remains unripened for a long of time or the ripening signs do not manifest clearly. The swelling is cold to touch or of the same color as that of the skin with mild pain or it is hard to touch like a stone and in this condition, this is a very a special condition called as rectapaka of swelling. So, you know, even in those days, a lot of people did not want to opt for surgery. And so, two options were given. As I was telling you, in Ayurveda, the focus is always on how to avoid surgery, although surgery was accepted. Uh, so two options are mentioned, one is using surgical instruments to cut open the wound and then remove the pus and, you know, materials, or making the abscess burst by itself. You know, by application of alkalis. So you can apply some paste, strong alkaline paste on the abscess. And by the application of this paste, the abscess bursts and all the pus is drained. So this is done in people who are frightened at the sight of surgical instruments. So this is the two options in people who are very mentally very weak or afraid of surgical instruments. You can even apply the space and cause it to burst on its own. Otherwise it is cut open by sharp instruments. So this is in Ayurveda, we say that we shouldn't do surgery on an unripe uh, swelling. Cutting open an unripe swelling can lead to diseases of the veins and tendons. It can lead to profuse bleeding. It can further increase the pain. And it can even lead to, you know, cellulitis. So cellulitis come, can come as a complication if we treat, if we do surgery in an unripe swelling.
Ah, oh, maybe you missed it. I will go back to those slides. So you see, these are the signs of a ripening swelling. The swelling gains a different color other than that of the skin. It is red colored in the stage of ripening. So I will explain again how the swelling ripens and then how it becomes fully ripe. It enlarges. Okay, no problem. So I will just quickly, uh, you know, uh, repeat it. Continuous bursting type of pain, aches all over the body, uh, yawning, different kinds of distressing symptoms. I was mentioning a little earlier also that, you know, you have burning sensation, increased temperature, systemic sign, uh, symptoms, excessive thirst, fever, loss of sleep. If little ghee is placed on the swelling, it melts. It's very difficult to touch. This tenderness, just like it's in an ulcer. And these are the signs of a ripened swelling. Now, in the stage of ripening, now the pain and the intensity of that pain becomes less. It generally shrinks. There is a whitish color, not too much of red color. And you can see in the ulcer, some skin will become wrinkled, little wrinkled. There will be wrinkles on the skin. It is depressed all around, but it will be elevated at the center. And you can also see, you know, the pus, the whitish pus is there at the central point of the ulcer. There is itching. More than the pain, there is itching. The swelling is mild. And overall, the, the ulcer now is more soft. It is not hard. In a ripe, unripe stage, the ulcer is very hard. Whereas in a ripened stage, it is soft. And if you touch and feel, the patient is able to tolerate. In an unripe or ripening stage, the patient cannot tolerate touching. And here you can feel the pus inside, just like you can feel water inside a bladder. So this is the sign of ripe swelling. And then I was mentioning the symptoms, and then we can decide what type of, you know, dosha is dominating. And then I mentioned, uh, you know, when uh, we do the surgical procedures, you can always do a non-surgical option first. In people who are afraid of surgery, there are some special pastes which if we apply, these ulcers or wounds will automatically burst open. And then, you know, it can be cut open by sharp instruments. Uh, in people who are able to tolerate surgical procedures. So this is the, uh, you know, approach. And then I came to this point that surgery is not recommended on unripe swelling. So a surgeon, uh, you know, is, is considered to be unskilled and to be condemned if he attempts to cut open a surgical wound that has not been actually fully ripened. I hope this is clear. So we will continue. So before undertaking surgical opening of an abscess, you know, a lot of preparation has to be done for the patient. So when in those days they did pre-operative procedures. And only then did actually the surgical procedure. So in those days, instead of anesthesia, 
people were given strong alcoholic drinks and with this they were able to withstand the pain of the surgery. So we can imagine in those days surgery was a bit painful because there was not a very powerful or effective anesthetic that we have today. And uh, patients who are suffering from obstructive delivery or renal stone or disease of the mouth and abdomen, for such patients food or wine are not given before, before the surgery. So elaborate descriptions are given on how to make the incision. So we will not go into all the details because, you know, we are not going to get trained in doing these procedures anyway, but just to understand that everything is meticulously described in the Ayurvedic text. So all the equipments are kept ready and the physician makes to patient to sit fit, uh, facing east. The swelling is incised with this well sharpened instrument and, and quickly the incision is made. Sometimes many incisions have to be made if the abscess is really very large and occupying a large area. The interior is then thoroughly excavated with the probe finger to pairs of animals. The pus path is determined and cutting to the bulges, the entire pus is actually removed very carefully, completely scraped out and removed and a clean wound. Okay. This was prob probably done in those days when electricity was not there. And surgeries were usually done, you know, in the mornings. So we were facing the sun. So there is bright light to see the procedures. And then facing the sun is also considered to be auspicious because it is a symbol of life. So mainly one practical purpose was that when you face the sun, then there is enough light. These procedures were not done in the afternoon because surgery is not compatible with pitta. In the kapha period, the patient is able to withstand surgical procedures better. There is less bleeding. In the period in the evening, the patient is generally weak, so it is not done. So since it's done in the morning and the sun will be shining from the east, so that is one of the reasons why the east has recommended. And in this way, the <clears throat> complete is cleaned. And then the qualities of a good surgeon are explained. The good surgeon should have courage to be actually courage is to be handling these equipments on patients he should act very swiftly and the instrument should be kept very sharp there should be no sweating no trembling and the patient the person should not get confused and these are all the signs and qualities of a good surgeon The incision should always be made horizontally and curved in places such as the forehead, the brows, the gums of teeth, shoulders, abdomen, axillae, eye sockets, lips, cheeks, throats and groins. Uh, so even the places where specific types of incisions have to be meant have been mapped and explained.
and the places where horizontal incisions can cause problem that has also been kind of described now once the surgical procedure is done and the entire wound has been cleaned of all the pus and waste materials so now the patient has to be comforted with encouraging words and cold water the area all around is squeezed the wound is washed with decoction of uh, you know drugs moisture is removed by wiping with cotton wool and the wound is fumigated with the smoke of a lot of uh, disinfectant procedures it's very interesting that ayurveda practiced what you can antiseptic surgery much much before this was known in other parts of the world you know surgical instruments were sterilized before use the wounds were cleaned and also sterilized with special herbal medicines moisture was removed the wound was fumigated with again certain herbs these were all disinfecting procedures and because these procedures kept the wound sterile you know these problems were unknown to ayurvedic surgery of you know sepsis and such other problems which was a big concern in europe before antiseptic procedures were developed so uh, even many europeans have used this phrase the surgery was more butchery in those days because people would die not just because of the disease but also because of the complications after the surgery so in ayurveda these procedures of post operative procedures which are explained in great detail a procedures for sterilization and for you know enabling the wounds to heal very quickly so we prepared from paste of uh, mm seeds ghee honey and appropriate drugs are placed in the wound and also covered a thick plaster prepared from corn flour and ghee is put on and bandaged with a thick sheet of cloth and the wound is well secured and then left to heal so these are the procedures mentioned for surgery now the bandage cloth is also again very well specified the medicinal wick consists of cotton threads and so these are like you know healing bandages so they also knew that once a surgical wound was created was very susceptible to ins inspection they they found that the surgical wound was easily attacked by invisible beings which feed on blood including insects and flies and other evil beings which probably refer to what we understood today as microbes so they used a lot of herbs which were disinfectants and which would prevent these kind of attacks on the wounds and then certain lifestyle and dietary regimens were prescribed and with all these procedures the wound was allowed to completely heal the lifestyle and other uh, restrictions were you know followed very strictly so if you do strenuous activities the swelling will increase if you keep awake at night then the redness will increase if you sleep during day pain will increase and if you indulge in sexual intercourse then you know even that might happen in many serious surgical procedures now there are also specific diets after surgery and the purpose of this diet was actually to enable quick healing of the surgical wound and also to prevent recurrence of 
the disease, the main reasons for a specific diet. And mainly it was these kind of special vegetables and, you know, uh, food items were recommended to enable that the, the wounds heal very quickly and smoothly. Now, foods are supposed to be also chosen very carefully because in digestion and what we call as AMA production is to be well avoided during the healing of a surgical wound. So many foods were also specified which had to be avoided while you are in the post-surgical recovery phase to substances which cause constipation, burning sensation and uh, substances which can aggravate the doshas. Now these are also advices from Ayurveda which can be used to make outcomes of modern surgery better. Today we know very complicated surgeries. Sometimes the patients develop complications in this recovery phase. And when we identify identified such problems, how organ recovery can be ensured in the post-surgical state, And how, you know, the healing can be made complete, the recurrence can be prevented. So all these pre and post operative procedures, how bleeding can be minimized, how we can prevent, uh, you know, post surgical infections. All these things are principles that are relevant even today. And even if we are going to use modern methodologies and instruments for actual doing the main surgical procedure, we could still integrate it with all the other supportive, you know, measures. So on the third day of the post-operative procedure, the same things are repeated. So you can again see here that in Ayurveda we have described the surgical recovery procedures in great, uh, you know, detail and elaboration. And, uh, you know, redressing of the wounds are also explained. And the specific time of weeks, medicated weeks, which are to be kept on the wound to cleaning, they have to be replaced uh, after in between. And so the ulcer has to be cleaned because even the dressing of the ulcer can sometimes lead to complications. And two or few ways in which complications can occur is post-surgically if you do not bandage the ulcer well, then the bandage can actually cause further putrefaction and damage to the ulcer. Or if unripe ulcer has been wrongly cut open, then it, sh it should be 
you know, further subject it to some treatments which will enable its ripening and, you know, help the ulcer to ripen and be completely cleared. So these are the treatment procedures for, you know, normal abscesses, which require surgical intervention. And after that in Ayurveda are mentioned the emergency wound management. Today we call this as trauma care. This is also well described in Ayurveda. Ah, okay. To ripen, we have to give actually hot substances, which will increase the heat. So we can do two things in an unripe swelling. So this is where you need some skill. You can either make the unripe swelling to shrink without ripening. So if it is in the very early stage, we can do that. And here we need to use cool substances. So that which will pacify Pitta. So Pitta is what really matters. So if you use cool substances that pacify Pitta, then we can prevent an unripe wound or ulcer from becoming ripe. So this is possible in the very early stage, not in advanced stage. So if you want, if you think the unripe ulcer has already become too, uh, you know, advanced, then if you want to ripen it, then we will use hot substances. This will be pitta increasing. So when you apply these substances, the unripe wound will ripen. Is this clear? So traumatic wounds actually require basically stitching and suturing and repairing. So here the treatment is mainly focused on bringing the organs or structures back into their normal positions and then quickly you know suturing them so that they are stitched together again and then they will heal and then become you know completely uh, normal so wherever we have made long incisions and when there are structures in the body which are separated in all these areas we need to suture so I read also describes where you need to suture the skin back so that you know the opening is closed and some wounds do not need suture but some wounds need suture. So we need to be able to make this discrimination and distinction. So certain wounds should not be sutured immediately. These are the wounds on the groins, the axilla, which are less muscular and movable, ulcers which emit gas, which are foreign bodies inside, and which are produced by alkalis and poisons or fire. These should not be sutured. The suturing them then can lead to complications. So Ayurveda thereby clearly describes the wounds that 
need suturing and those that do not need suturing. So once the suturing, before doing the suturing, we have to remove all the foreign bodies, blood clots, grass, hairs, etc. And, you know, replace the organs back into their normal position and alignment. So a lot of repair of the organs have to be done before you can suture them. So traumatic surgery is not about removing substances, just removing substances from the body, but surgical repair of damaged body parts. So suturing should also done uh, very skillfully. The each suture should be separated from each other with the proper distance. And it be neither too far or too close. And the tissues should not be held too closely, too much of the tissue should not be tied to suture or too less because of too much of tissue is tied then the whole skin becomes tight and you know there is a prominence if it is too thin then the skin may break open again and after suturing patient should be comforted again and should be given drinks and all those things and then the the suit the wound clean sterilized and then and bandaged with the application of medicine so this is the procedure for and now there is also the scraping of the edges of the wound the edges of the ulcer which are not be bleeding should be scraped a little to induce bleeding and then it is shared when the blood is flowing so you know fresh blood supply it was very well recognized in ayurveda that for the wounds to heal there should be fresh blood so if if the surgeon uh feels that the blood supply to the region is not good then that area is scraped actually to make blood flow the area is made to bleed a little so that you know blood flows well So this movement of the blood is the cause for the healing of the ulcers. Is this clear? The bleeding, the scraping and bleeding done for, you know, making the wound to heal properly. 
And now in Ayurveda are described different types of bandages. Some of these bandages are surgical wounds and some of the bandages are also for, you know, stabilizing the various body parts and joints. So the bandages are made of different substances. They're made from silk, they're made from leather, they're made from different types of cloths. So Ayurveda also describes the properties of the various types of materials. Now this is also what makes the Ayurvedic theory sometimes a little bit more sophisticated. Because you can see, according to the type of material used for bandaging, uh, you know, we can also modify the effect on the doshas. So, a cold material can be used for pitta, a warm material can be used for kapha or vata, and wounds which have more of fat and kapha is covered with thin sheets of copper, iron, zinc, or lead, and so on. So the fractures. So when fractures are treated, bandaging is done by using leather, bark of trees and splints, and then hard and flat pieces of bamboo, wood, metal, etc. So bandages are made out of different substances, different cloths and materials, and the choice of these substances and materials will enable us to, you know, create a specific effect on doshas and, you know, involved in the actual problem. So this is very interesting. So a lot of bandages are described. So there are 15 bandages mentioned uh, in some of the basic Ayurvedic texts. Now, kosha is a kind of encasing bandage. So, this is like an enclosure. And this is used for joints of the fingers. It completely covers the finger. And then there is the swastika type. It's a cross type bandage, which is used for the ears, the axilla, on the breast and the joints. And then there is a special type of... Uh, bandage called mitoli, which is used for the penis and then for the neck and so on. And there is the china bandage. This is not china, but in science could be called this as china bandage. This is used uh, on the outer side of the eyes. And then we have the bandage called dama, which is used at junctions like the groins. And Anuvelita is a type of, you know, encircling bandage, which is used in the extremities. And then we have the Katwa type of bandage, which is a flat type of bandage. It's used for the cheeks, lower jaw, and temples. Then the Vibandha, which is a, you know, tight bandage, which is used for the back and abdomen. And there is the Stakiga for the thumb, fingers, and tip of the penis the hernia in the groins. So this is uh, to stabilize a protruding part. And vitana is a very spreading type of bandage which is used for the head and organs which are thick and broad. And then we have supportive brand, uh, bandaging for parts that are hanging. For the nose, lips and joints, we certain types of joints, we have what is called as a goshpana bandage which you know, fixes the, the nose in a stable manner. So yamaka is a dual bandage when you have to bandage two ulcers simultaneously. Mandala is a circular bandage. And panchanki means the bandage has five appendages. And this is used for complex structures above the shoulder. Uh, when you have to tie it, you know, in a very stable manner so that there is no movement. 
So 15 types of bandages are described and it's very interesting to see how each of these bandage is designed to adapt to you know, a particular organ that it is actually dealing with. Now, bandages are also decided on the basis of tightness. Now, this description is interesting for us because, you know, even in non-surgical conditions, we actually do a lot of bandaging nowadays. So, the bandaging that we do today are kind of, you know, the supports, the belts that we use. So the tightness has also has to be decided based on the organ and area where we are applying these bandages. So the tight bandages are used over the thighs, buttocks, axillae, the groins and head. And it should be moderate over the extremities, face, ears, chest, back, flanks and neck and abdomen so depending on the organ the tightness should be very tight or moderately tight places which are neither hard or flabby then it should be very tight and it should be uh, you know very tight if the ulcer is situated on the organs of vata and kapha a moderately tight bandage can be used to the eyes and joints The bandage should be removed once in three days in the cold season and spring seasons. So certain bandages, sometimes we have to apply it very loosely because it should be moderately tight on hard parts if the ulcer on them are produced by pitta and recta. So when vata and kapha are involved, we can use tight bandages. When pitta or recta is involved, you should use loose bandages. Because tight bandaging can trap the heat inside and then it can lead to saturation, skin problems. Skin will be very tender when there is pitta, so it should be made loose. And sometimes if pitta is too aggravated, we shouldn't be tying it at all. And in summer and in autumn, bandage should be removed in the evening and morning and it should also be made. Now is described the reasons for bandaging. The ulcer needs to be bandaged because otherwise it will be affected by the bites of you know, mosquitoes, cold breeze. So in Ayurveda, as I was mentioning, the importance of sterility was recognized at a very early period. So for this reason, the bandages were all kept very secure and the wounds were you know, not exposed to the various uh, mosquitoes and uh, microbes that could attack it. So bandaging was found to actually facilitate healing of wounds and ulcers and fractures and in severe injuries where tendons and veins are cut and severed. And also bandaging helped the patient's person to move around without further causing damage to these injured sides. So bandaging, one of the purposes of bandaging was also to give better mobility and uh, you know to also prevent pain and discomfort because without bandaging if you were to move around 
the damaged body parts would be more mobile and then it would cause more discomfort. So these are all the reasons why you know, bandaging was done. So there are some variations and exceptions. So different types of bandagings are done. Sometimes we can, instead of using cloth or other bandages, in Ayurveda, even herbs, leaves were used. Tender leaves were used, well washed. The tree, the leaves from plants which have milky sap, all these were also used to help the wound to heal in a faster and better manner. So in other words, we also had herbal bandaging done in Ayurveda. So the herbs would be chosen depending on the type of dosha involved. And this facilitates healing much faster. Now there are some contraindications of bandaging. Bandaging should not be done for ulcers which are of, you know, leprosy, for burns by fire. We already indicated this a little bit earlier. So these are the conditions in which bandaging is not indicated because the bandaging can actually aggravate the condition. Like if you bandage a burn, then the burn is already, it will stick on to the bandage and when you try to remove the bandage, the skin will be further damaged. So in such kind of wounds where bandage, uh, the, the wound will stick on to the bandage and then when the removal of the bandage will be very difficult or when bandaging can actually cause further suppuration. So in certain types of poisoning, when the muscles are putrefied, when there are severe ulcerations, in these conditions, you know, you're not allowed to apply bandages. So in Ayurveda, it has also been described that flies can deposit worms or bacteria inside the ulcers, which are not protected by bandaging. And then this can cause a lot of, uh, you know, problems. The, back, the wounds can become septic. And that's a very special formulation, disinfecting for, uh, formulation, which has been used to deal with such ulcers, which have been infected. And then these bacteria and unwanted substances are quickly removed to enable the wound to heal faster. So the ulcers in which the doshas are not completely removed should not be healed with haste because it only heals from the outside. Inside there will be still problems. And even after the surgery is done and the wounds have healed, the patient should, uh, un, uh, you know, stick to some regimens to prevent recurrence of the problem or further damage to the body parts which have just healed. And so this is in brief the description of the surgical procedures. So is this clear? Okay. So we have some more subjects 
to discuss and these are all part of the surgical procedures and one is bloodletting by vein the puncturing of the vein and after that we have two more topics to discuss today and that is about uh, the use of alkaline strong alkaline substances which will burn and destroy tissue when it is required and also the application of heat or thermocautery to destroy certain tissues with that we will complete the overview of ayurvedic surgery so let us now look at bloodletting So in Ayurveda, as I told, we must do bloodletting and again all surgical and such procedures, the Ayurvedic approach is actually to avoid it as much as possible. And we need to do it only when all other methods actually fail. So the features of pure blood are first described. Bloodletting is required only if the purity of the blood is affected. So pure blood is slightly sweet and salt in taste. And this indicates that it is a combination of pitta and kapha. It is neither too hot nor too cold. It resembles the color of a lotus or the indragopa insect gold blood of sheep and rabbit and the characteristics properties of pure blood it is the cause of the origin of the body and when blood is in its normal you know quality and quantity then there is no need for bloodletting so the first step in ayurveda is to be able to decide whether there is really uh, the arrangement of the blood usually because i was mentioning blood is made by a combination of pitta and kapha blood gets vitiated by pitta and kapha and then it produces diseases such as herpes abscess diseases of the spleen so even by knowing the <clears throat> nature of the disease we are able to understand whether blood is involved. So tumors of the abdomen, dyspepsia, fever, diseases of the mouth, eyes and head, intoxication, excessive thirst, salty taste in the mouth, you know, gouty arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, bleeding disorders and certain acidic disorders of the stomach then there are curable diseases which do not respond to you know the standard non-surgical treatments and these are the conditions in which you can suspect that there is you know imbalance in the blood and then you have to do the ayurvedic treatment however we have to be extremely careful because bloodletting cannot be done in all the patients. So people who are less than 16 years or more than 70 years of age are not recommended for bloodletting. Those who have had no bleeding previously, any time due to any cause, they are not included those who have undergone excess uh, you know snehana or swedana which are the preparatory procedures for panchakarma they are also not included for bloodletting those suffering from diseases of vata origin pregnant uh, woman you know, woman after childbirth, 
those who are suffering from digestion and bleeding diseases or breath problems, cough and cold, diarrhea, dysentery, those who are suffering from ascites or inter intestinal obstruction or enlargement of the abdomen, these are people who would not be chosen for blood type. So persons, uh, those who are had extreme vomiting or those who have anemia and those who are suffering from dropsy, those who have undergone snehapana or oleation therapy. These are all people who should avoid. So there's a big list of people in whom, you know, the surgery may not be effective. I mean, bloodletting is not suitable and can lead to unwanted complications. So this list has been described. So the vein should not be cut without enforcing control on the body. The vein, which is horizontal, which has not been raised up. And you know, when the climate is favorable, it is considered this is to actually prevent excessive bleeding. So this is to ensure that the vein is not cut or punctured in the wrong way and that there is not excessive. So a lot of preparation has to be done before we take the patient for bloodletting through cutting a vein. And then there are very specific sites for venesection. In diseases of the head and eyes, in different diseases, we have to cut the veins in different places. And we can just very quickly run through some of these indications. In diseases of the head and eyes, the veins are situated on the forehead. Our eyes of the eyes are, you know, cut. In the disease of the ear, the veins are cut near the ear. In disease of the nose, vein located at the tip of the nose. In rhinitis, vein located in the nose and forehead. So I don't want to read all these things because these are not maybe going to be practically done by you, but it's just to understand as an Ayurvedic, if you are doing involved in Ayurvedic, you know, treatments and procedures, it's always good to know what the scope of such procedures in Ayurveda and what care needs to be given to be able to, uh, you know, do these uh, procedures. So in specific diseases, again, very specific veins are described. The vital spot in the center of the calf muscle in pain of thighs and uh, specific diseases like Kruspika the swelling of the knee joint, in, in gouty arthritis, in tingling sensation of the feet, in fissures of the feet, in sprain of the foot and the ankle, and this is the nails and toes, vein uh, situated above the chipra marma, and all these things, you know, pain in the arms in the same way as that of the sciatica. Uh, specific spots have been mentioned. So this is quite elaborately mapped in the Ayurvedic text. These are based on the marmas and the vital points which portions to avoid, which portions to be injured, which will not harm the body. And there are options that if the veins are not visible, then another vein situated in the nearby place. And the main point is that we have to avoid the vital spot. So these details are all described in the Ayurvedic texts. So at this point, you know, we have spent now an hour and 10 minutes again. So since we have a long session, we'll have uh, one more hour after this. So we'll be approximately four hours. Uh, and today's topic, surgery, is not so practically relevant. So many of the remaining slides will be dealt with very briefly. we continue uh, with the discussion. So the procedure for doing venesection is now described. The patient has to undergo, first of all, the snehana procedure, 
this is to ensure that when the bloodletting is done, it does not, you know, uh, cause a sudden depletion in the blood volume or increase of vata. When blood is removed from the body, then vata will increase. So before doing the bloodletting procedure, we are just giving some strength to the body to ensure that, you know, it is uh, uh, strong enough. All the equipments are kept ready. And uh, they are also made to consume some meat juice and some slight food so that, you know, there is enough nourishment, enough body fluids. And then the patient is made to be exposed to the sunlight or fire so that he undergoes a slight sweating. So too much of direct swedhana is not done, a mild indirect swedhana is done. And then the person is asked to sit on a stool of the height of the knee and a, a soft cloth is tied around his head at the lower border of the hairs. And the elbows are kept on his knees. The neck is massaged briskly with his fists, the fists of the hand. So these procedures are done. The tightening of the uh, area is done. The skin is made tight so that the veins become raised and the veins become visible. So the preparatory step is done to ensure that you are able to see the veins through the skin. And all this tying and tightening is done so that the veins project outside. So the veins are then very clearly visualized. So the raised vein is then tapped with the middle finger of the physician and then tripped off by the thumb. And after the elevation has been clearly perceived and then the vein is slightly, you knead the vein with the thumb so that it becomes really very much projected outside. And then holding the ax with the left hand and placing its edge on the middle portion of the vein. The axe is lifted and the tapping and kneading the vein is done. The aim is taken and the vein of the nose is cut with the Brihi Mukha Shastra, which is a type of lancet. So for bloodletting, there are specific uh, instruments and this instrument is shaped like the grain of a rice. The vein situated on the tongue is cut in the patient to keep the tip of the tip of the tongue raised and biting it, holding it firmly by the upper row of the teeth. So in different procedure, uh, positions, the procedure for uh, cutting the vein is slightly different. And then when you have to cut the veins of the feet, the feet are kept steady. The foreleg is massaged briskly from the knee downwards towards the ankle with the hands. And then a band is tied. And the other leg is kept slightly bent. So in all these ways, the principle here is that the vein is made to be uh, made for completely visible and accessible and then it is cut. And even the size of the incision has been very much specified depending on the location of the vein. So, you know, just above the place where the vein is cut, as we discussed a little earlier, we tie the cloth very tightly. So in this way, after accessing the uh, vein, and if we are making the cutting in a very proper manner, then the blood will flow out very steadily. Just like it will come in a stream, in a steady stream, 
and it stops when the control is released. Uh, have you seen this procedure of many sections? how this is done. I mean, there are videos which actually explain and demonstrate, you know, how this uh, procedure is done. Okay. So, I don't know if uh, a video can actually be shown on this platform, but maybe I can also give you some links. It would be good to watch some of these procedures. Anyway, I will discuss uh, with the organizers and see if some of the procedures related to the Ayurvedic surgical, you know, procedures can actually be shared so that you can also have a visual idea of how these things are done. So if cutting is inadequate, then the flow is only for a short time. And in that case, we have to promote more bleeding by mixing lime powder and oil. If the cut is too much, then the blood comes out very strongly and it, is, it becomes difficult to stop the bleeding. And this can be dangerous. So usually when we do this venisection, only about 200, 250 to maximum 300 ml blood is actually moved and this is very similar to the blood that we give when we donate. So fear of the patient fainting on seeing blood, the loose band, torniquet, blunt insulin, excessive heating or you know debility, uh, the urge to pass urine fecus, absence of sweating therapy, these are all the causes of the absence of blood flow. So when the blood is not flowing out in sufficient the cut end of the vein should be smeared with oil processed with certain herbs and, and then the blood begins to flow out properly and it should be smeared with warm oil and salt. So the vitiated blood flows out first and then the oil flows out. So after sufficient bleeding, the flow stops by itself. And then we can stop the procedure. So this is how the bloodletting is done. So it sometimes ha happens that when the patient sees the, the blood, he or she can faint and then we can this is uh, a normal uh, event that happens sometimes and we just need to revive the patient and complete the bloodletting procedure. But if there is repeated fainting, then the procedure can be stopped and continued the next day. So this fainting is more psychological and not really related to the loss of blood, but we need to make a discrimination uh, and differentiate between the fainting that comes due to actually loss of blood and its problem or the fainting that happens due to you know just the fright of having to you know see one's own blood So signs of impure blood, by examining the blood, we will be able to also find out what extent the blood has become impure, what has caused the impurity. So the blood that has been affected by vata will be bluish in color, dry, non-slimy. It flows with force. It is clear and frothy. 
So when you see the bloodletting done, we have to make an examination of the blood that comes out. And by looking at this blood, we will be able to decide what dosha is involved. When blood is, uh, you know, affected by pitta, it will be yellowish or black. It has foul smell. It is not thick because of increase of heat. And uh, it is very thin and so it flows and bleeds more. And when blood is affected by kapha, it will be unctuous. It will be having a pale yellowish tinge. Uh, you can, all blood will be red in color, but you can find some shades of other colors. It will be thread slimy and thick. The blood which is having more of kapha will clot very easily. So when the more than one dosha combines, then you will find mixed features. And blood which is affected by all the doshas will be very turbulent and thick. So examining the blood from an Ayurvedic perspective is also important because after the bloodletting we have to give herbs and other medication, you know, to balance and pacify the uh, doshas. So the examination of the blood enables us to understand what is the underlying you know, doshic imbalance. How much quantity uh, can we remove? So the maximum allowed for removal is 168, but sometimes we remove only half of this quantity. So more than 768, even in very healthy, strong individuals, is not recommended. And Ayurveda was very well aware that excess breathing can lead to death or dreadful diseases due to water vishish. So when there is, uh, you know, more bleeding, then measures to pacify vata should be done. Oil massage, drinking of milk, and, you know, also intake of blood. In those days, blood transfusion was not possible. So, you know, people used to... Actually, replenish with blood through the oral route or through enemas. So, when the blood has completely flown out, uh, flow, uh, flowed out, then the controls are removed slowly. The site is washed with cold water, and uh, the cut end of the vein is covered with cotton swab soaked in oil and bandaged. So, if more blood is to be removed, it could be repeated again in the same evening, but we have to make sure that the quantity of the blood removed in different sittings is not too much beyond the prescribed. If there is too much of uh, vitiation of the doshas and more, uh, you know, removal is required, then this should be done only after 14 days, it should not be done immediately in the next day. Uh, if very little after the removal of the blood, if we suspect that there is still some 
unwanted materials inside, then, you know, that can be left as it is because they can be managed with medicines. And so too much of attempt to cleanse the body should not be done. So too much of blood shouldn't be removed. After a limit, we have to then switch over to medicines in order to prevent unnecessary complications. Other options are, you can resort to other methods. You can use the cupping method to remove the remaining little blood, or it can be purified by doshas, by doing therapies, purificatory therapies and other internal medicines. And also, bloodletting should not be done when you can actually correct the blood and the doshas with the use of medications. So bleeding which does not stop, you know, which this should be smeared with the powder of, you know, various substances. And these are described, these are herbal medicines which can stop bleeding. And then there are also special uh, formulations which are used to ensure that you know patient is not affected by the loss of blood these will help to quickly replenish the lost blood and stabilize the blood volume so if you want to uh, prevent bleeding from a, a vein that has been cut we can also use cautery the vein can be burnt mildly with the help of a strong uh, molten iron rod and when this is done the bleeding will stop so after the bloodletting is done We have to follow a lot of uh, you know, procedures. Especially diet restrictions. So when you apply this tourniquet or bandage, the doshas may get temporarily aggravated and move to other parts of the body. And when the tourniquet is removed, they come back. So one should follow a very good diet during this period. And foods which are neither very hot nor very cold, which are light or easy to digest, these should be taken after removal of blood. One should not take foods that can disturb and vitiate the doshas because the very purpose of removing the blood was to remove the vitiated doshas. Also, when you have removed blood, the digestive power or the digestive agni will become weak and there will be low digestive activity. So the diet has to be, you know, chosen very carefully. So when the blood is pure, there is excellence of color and complexion. There is improved power of the sense organs. There is good perception of objects by the sense organs. There is good digestive activity, the enjoyments of comforts, good nutrition and immunity. So these are all the benefits of having, you know, purity of heart. And so with this, we conclude the topic on bloodletting. And now we have just one more topic to complete for today's webinar, and that is the alkaline and thermocotter. So 
Alkaline and thermocautery measures are done even when surgery fails. So if we look at the treatments of cancer, uh, we can bring things to perspective. So alkali and thermocautery, we can even very grossly, they are not exact equivalents, but grossly compare them to chemotherapy and radiation. So we know in cancer, when surgery does not work, then we do chemotherapy and after chemotherapy we may do also radiation. So chemical burning of tissue and burning of tissue by the application of heat. These are the two So alkaline therapy is chemical burning and thermocautery is burning with the heat. So now we will quickly review which are the contexts in which these treatments are described in Ayurveda. So chemical cautery is called as charakara. So, according to Ayurveda, the chara and agni karmas are actually more powerful than surgery. And uh, chara is considered to be a very powerful surgical tool. It can perform many functions like incision, excision. It can also be used in inaccessible places. So, it is very helpful in diseases that are generally considered to be incurable and the effect of these chemical substances are that it burns tissues which are not useful to the body or which may do harm to them and in, in conditions where surgical excision or removal is not possible these substances help now you can take this uh, chara as an oral drink and this is like you know internal administration as uh, just chemotherapeutic agents they are given internally and these are helpful in hemorrhoids in dyspepsia and renal alveoli, tumors of the abdomen in ascites and certain types of chronic poisoning so in the form of direct application which means you apply it externally onto certain, you know, uh, roots or lesions like warts and moles in leucoderma, in external piles, skin diseases, in anesthetic patches, in, in rectal fistula, in cancerous growth, in tumors and fibroids, and in fowl and sinus. Ulcers. In all these conditions, we apply chara externally. Chara cannot be used when pitta and recta are involved, <clears throat> when vata is very much diminished. It cannot be given in conditions, again, like fever or diarrhea or dysentery, disease of the heart and head, in pandu, that is anemia, anorexia, blindness. All conditions where pitta is likely to aggravate, we cannot apply chara. You cannot also give it to people who are extremely fearful and coward. We cannot give it to pregnant and menstruating women, women who has difficult menstrual flow. So it cannot be given when the food remains undigested. It cannot be given for infants and old persons. It cannot be used on soft structures of the body like arteries, joints, vulnerable spots, cartilages, 
because the application of Sharat completely destroyed and damaged those structures. So places which are not having much muscles, the testis, the penis, the orifices, the passages, the inner part of the nail, and in diseases of the eyes, and except those of the eyelids, and during cold, rainy, and hot seasons, and on days when the sun is not seen. So we have to avoid those conditions in which these chemical cauteries can actually damage the body. Now the preparation of uh, caustic alkali is very interesting procedure. Alkaline substances are made by burning herbs. Herbs are actually burned and uh, you know the ash is collected. So all the details are given here on how to make the caustic alkali. So, the ash is actually mixed with water and well stirred and at the bottom of the vessel you can collect the alkaline substance. This alkaline substance which comes as a fit, as a filtrate as a sediment when we you know stir the water this sediment is collected and transferred to an iron vessel and then it is cooked still with the help of a spoon and the ash of limestone the shell pearl shell clay the corn shell and such other substances are added. Many other chemicals are also added. So you can make different types of charas by changing the ingredients slightly. And then it begins to emit fumes, bubbles come up and then it becomes, you know, of a very solid consistency. Uh, when it's all dissolved and becomes very solid, then it is taken out. And then when it is cool, it is taken into an iron vessel and it is kept concealed inside a heap of barley. And this is the moderate chara. This is not a very strong alkaline preparation. It's moderately strong. And this is how the moderately strong preparation is made. So this is made into a powdered form. And then it is, uh, you know, kept. Now if you want to make a strong potency chara, but here we use herbs which are extremely strong and very corrosive. And some of the herbs described here in this uh, slide, may not be available everywhere in the world but these are extremely strong and corrosive and by adding these substances the chara becomes even more stronger and uh, so this becomes a very high potency chara and this can burn tissues even more powerfully. So when can alkaline substances be used? It should be used in diseases caused by vata, kapha and medas. It can be used in cancerous growths and such other conditions which are very difficult to cure. The alkali of medium potency is used when the diseases are moderate. And mild alkali is used in diseases which are also caused by pitta and blood. So usually a chara is not indicated in pitta conditions. But mild alkali can be given as an exception. So when the alkali loses its water content, some quantity of alkali solution should be added to strengthen it. 
So in this way, the alkali can be kept and stored and potentiated again by adding little water as and when required. So this is a slide which we need not discuss too much. It's just talking about the properties of a chara. The chara should not be too strong or too mild. It should be smooth, it should be smiley, slimy, I'm sorry, and it should be quick in spreading. It will be, when it's properly prepared, it will be white in color. And uh, it will remain like, uh, it should be made to remain like a mountain peak where it is applied. It should be as easily removable as it is easy to apply. It should not produce too much of exudation or moistness. It should not cause much pain. So these are the ideal qualities of a well-made caustic alkali. So a, a shara functions like a sharp surgical instrument and also the fire, also like a thermal cotton. So the diseases which, on which you're going to do alkaline therapy should be cut and scraped and then the alkali is taken in a rod, then it is kept on the spot. The other parts of the body are to be covered and well protected. And the part on which the alkali has been applied will burn away. If you wait for 100 moments. So in specific diseases in hemorrhoids, the tip of the file mass is found concealed and it should be manipulated by hand in such a way as to place the alkali on them. This is done inside the anal canal. So in the eyelids, you know, there's a specific way of applying it. In cancer of the nose, there is a specific way of applying the chara and piles, polyps. So according to the different kind of diseases and problems, chara can be applied in very specific ways. So after the application of chara, just like the surgical procedures, there are some post-procedural protocols to follow. So the alkali is wiped off with a cotton swab and then, you know, a mixture of ghee and honey is placed because that place is like a, a wound now. And then the patient should make sure that he consumes you know, food which will enable to moisten the the ulcer which has been dried by the dried and burnt by the application of the chara. And the paste of sesame seed and the licorice mixed with ghee is recommended to be applied to heal the ulcer produced by the chara. So when the chara or alkaline chemical has been applied properly that area will attain black color similar to the ripe fruit of jamun and there will be a depression at the site and these are the signs of proper application the opposite indicates that it is not properly applied it may take a coppery red color and there can be pricking pain itching and these are all indications that the uh, substance has not been applied in a proper manner. And when there is overburning by chara, it can cause bleeding, fainting, burning sensation, fever, and it can also cause damage to the structures. So in the rectum, it can even cause blockage, and in the nose, it can damage the sense of smell, cause bleeding and structural damage. So in such conditions, paste of honey, ghee, and sesame are used. Then we have to use foods and other uh, substances that can pacify vata and pitta, and uh, you know which can cool the system. Sore substances are recommended to be poured on the wounds caused by chara because you know cold sour is cold to touch. And when it is mixed with alkali, it neutralizes the alkali. And therefore, the burn caused by the alkali can be significantly reduced. So, chara is a tricky thing. Strong charas are extremely dangerous. They are like weapons. And so, a physician should handle it very, very carefully. And now we come to the last topic 
of today's discussion and this is thermal cautery that is burning tissue by the application of fire itself so thermal cautery is better than even chara for when a, a tissue is destroyed by fire then the chances of recurrence is almost zero so this is uh, very helpful in diseases and conditions which cannot be even cured by surgery or charakarma. So this is used in skin, muscles, vein, tendons, joints and bones. And in diseases like black moles, the weakness of body parts, headache, diseases of the eyes, warts, cysts, so here the burning is done with a lighted wick, the tooth of a cow. So various substances are used. They are heated and then this heat is applied on the tissue that we need to destroy. So thermal cautery is indicated in conditions which don't respond to surgery or the application of, of uh, chara. And usually it results in the destruction of that tissue. So this treatment should not be done those, for those who, in whom we cannot do chara karma. So in those persons, we cannot also do agni karma. So wounds in which there is a foreign body or accumulation of blood inside. In people whom there are, you know, damage or uh, trauma to the abdominal viscera, those who are suffering from serious wounds in such uh, people we cannot do the thermal court so when the the place which has been you know damaged or burnt by the the fire it should be smeared with a combination of So the site, uh, we have to apply it with uh, honey and ghee. And when the site is properly burnt, then the ble there's no bleeding, there's a crackling sound, a little limb comes out, the area has the, uh, you know, pigeon dark gray appearance, and the wound heals without much pain. So then we can know that we have done proper thermal cautery. If the thermal cautery is improper, then there is, in a, you know, four types of burning. Bad burning happens. Uh, sometimes inadequate burning happens. And all these can lead to discomfort for the patients. So when there is over a burning, there is drooping down of the muscles. There is constriction. There's burning sensation. There's feeling as if hot fumes are coming out. There is severe pain. There is destruction of the veins, excessive thirst, fainting, loss of consciousness, and worsening of the wound, and even death can happen. So when we have such complications, and then we have to use specific substances, there are herbs and other medicines which are prescribed to be mixed with ghee and applied on the wound created by the excess burning. So, pitta specifying treatments have to be done. And depending on the type of substance that was used to 
create the thermo, thermal wound, we have to choose specific herbs. So these details are described. We don't need to discuss all that because this may not be practically used. Uh, so, so to conclude, we can say the knife, alkali, and fire are you know, very strong weapons which the physician can use with discretion. They are very helpful in treating diseases that do not respond to other types of you know, interventions. And even today in India, all these measures are used. Surgery is used by Ayurvedic physicians in limited conditions. The chara or alkaline substances are used in many diseases and also burning and thermocautery is done in very specific conditions. And there's a lot of interesting documentation and research that has shown that in these areas, they are very effective. So with this, we conclude our topic of surgery. Amongst all the topics that we discussed, this one topic is perhaps not of much practical significance for people who are practicing Ayurveda from outside of India. But the purpose of discussion is to show that uh, surgery is also an option for treatment in Ayurveda and that we cannot look at Ayurveda always as an alternative to, you know, modern surgery. Uh, but if you judiciously look at these guidelines from Ayurveda, then we can identify those conditions in which surgery is really warranted. So in the next uh, webinar, we will talk about Rasayana. And so today we conclude our discussion on surgery.